What's driving the worsening demonization of China in the international press? Why should it not be a problem that China has not become more like the West? What is China then in terms of political system? Is China a democracy? Welcome to a special edition of The Point with me, Li Xin. My guest today is Professor Daniel A. Bell, Dean of the School of Political Science and Public Administration of Shandong University in Eastern China. Welcome, Professor Bell, to The Point. Professor Bell, thank you very much for accepting our interview. In a recent presentation, you were asked to cast doubt on the idea that China is fundamentally different than what people are used to in the West. And you talked about the demonization of China in Western media, that China is both different and bad, and you said such ideas are empirically wrong. Why do you think there is, in the first place, this uh, demonization of China in the Western media? Uh, could you give some examples? Well, most of the news about China is negative. I guess that's mm, not necessarily uncommon um, in terms of reporting, because most of the reporting in the press in the Western media tends to focus on negative stories. But I guess what's particular about the reporting on China is that it's almost all negative. Um, it's very hard to publish, for example, op-eds or comments in mainstream media that are not completely negative. Whereas in my own experience, uh, including in mainstream media, it was possible to publish comments and op-eds and they welcome views that try to um, be balanced and that try to portray positions that were quite common uh, in China among Chinese intellectuals and political reformers and so on. But now it's very, very hard to publish um, such comments and op-eds in mainstream Western media. I think the South China Morning Post among the Anglophone media is the one um, exception. Um, but it's mm -hmm. also that there are some blatantly false stories that get a lot of airway, uh, which wasn't true before. And one example, again, from my own experience, the distinguished historian, uh, Neil Ferguson, he made an allegation in, in the Times of London in his um, co we weekly column, if I recall, or bi-weekly, that on January 23rd, um, uh, when uh, the Chinese government closed flights from Wuhan to the rest of China, that mm -hmm. the Chinese government allowed flights from Wuhan to the rest of the world, as though implying that there was some sort of plot to infect the rest of the world with COVID. Now, when I saw that, I asked, I asked uh, Professor Ferguson, um, I a polite email, I said, that just sounds a bit dubious to me. Do you have any evidence and he became very upset and so on. Um, so then I, we, it was very simple to just check some track to track some of the flight records and it turns out there were no flights after January 23rd other than humanitarian flights um, from Wuhan to this world. So, but yet that allegation became so popular and to the point that yeah. Pres then President Trump and leading officials from his own administration made such claims, blatantly false. Why do you think why do you think this kind of story, uh, or in general, the demonization of China is, uh, is gaining popular or given such room? Um, well, there's many factors. I mean, um, are, I think the, the main, most important factor is that until a few years ago, there was hope in the West. It's, a, I guess, a kind of form of self-love that as China modernizes e economically, it'll become more like us, um, politically, uh, socially, culturally. But now I think there's greater awareness, which is good in a way, a recognition that, um, sure, we have many things in common, um, but China has its own culture and civilization, its own economic system and political system, and that no, won't necessarily converge upon um, the dominant models in Western countries. Not only that, but that in some ways might do better. And I think that poses a threat to, especially to, well, to countries that are used to being uh, number one uh, in the world and getting their say uh, on, on the world stage, mm -hmm. that, that, that view is threatened. I mean, of course, there are also some internal developments in China that contribute to that image. Um, 
we maybe come to that in just a moment, but in, in your presentation, you talked about the, the, under, the realization that China has not become more like people in the, or like systems in the West, and you, you believe this should not be a problem. Could you elaborate? Um, well, we have some common values, um, commitments to, and I think they're universal, like uh, people have a right not to be tortured, not to be enslaved, uh, innocent people shouldn't be murdered, genocide is bad, and also people have a right not to be poor, that people have a right to basic material needs. I mean, I think those are universal values, and I think they're shared in principle, um, both in the West and in China and in much of the rest of the world. I mean, frankly, only crazy terrorists would openly, would, would open, would openly defy those norms. But when it comes to what's the right way of selecting political leaders or what's the right way to organize an economy, then we should allow for morally legitimate variation. I mean, it, why, for example, should we think that um, the only legitimate way to select political leaders regardless of the size of the political community, regardless of the culture, uh, regardless of the economic system, uh, regardless of the national conditions, is one person, one vote. I mean, that just seems like an extremely dogmatic view. Um, and, and, but I think it's one that's widely held in the West, um, not just yeah. among the media, but among ordinary uh, citizens, among intellectuals, as well as among political leaders. And it's a relatively new consensus. It wasn't the case before World War II. Well, you talked about the biggest difference between the Chinese political system and the Western liberal style democracy being how the top leader of the country is selected. Um, in your understanding, where does the legitimacy of this method come from in the Chinese environment and, and political ecology? Well, it's, it's not just the leader, I mean, the top leader. I mean, it's, it's leaders at the higher levels of government. Um, and there's a very long tradition in China, which in English we call political meritocracy, in Chinese, xian nang zheng zhi. And the basic idea is that, the, and it's an ideal, that the political system should aim to select and promote public officials who have superior ability and virtue. And throughout, I mean, basically for more than 2000 years, there's been a debate over how to do that. Um, what are the best mechanisms that are uh, that can help us to select officials with superior ability and virtue. Of course, the most famous one is the examination system, which the Keju system, which has a 1,300 year history in China or so, and which has been revived in different uh, ways over the past 40 years. Um, but there's many, there's many other mechanisms that have been used to select public officials with superior ability and virtue some of which are more effective than others. And, there's, and it's a constant argument. There's no fixed state. It really depends on, well, on, on the level of economic development and also on the na national conditions as to which mechanism is most effective at a particular point in time. It's also very interesting because uh, as we know for Chinese uh, official or Chinese person to go up the ranks of the Chinese officialdom, they probably have to spend decades, right, uh, in the from the grassroots and then to the middle ranges, and then eventually, if they're uh, deemed able and uh, you know um, um, effective in their governance, they will be promoted to a much higher level of, and that would take decades in the making. Whereas in the West, you would see people who are in their 20s and their 30s and probably have never had any public office, such as Donald Trump, and they're able to be elected in the system. Uh, how do you compare these two and, uh, and in terms of the effectiveness in, in selecting talents to govern the country? Well, I mean, in, in the West, you have variation as well. So in countries that have strong political parties like um, Germany, you have the political parties that also train leaders over decades. Well, that system is breaking down now. But obviously, just from an ideal point of view, um, when it would be desirable to choose public officials who have a proven record of making informed political judgments at different levels of government and doing different things. Um, uh, you know, as, as you know, in China, the public officials have to serve in poor parts of China and more wealthier parts of China and so on. They have to have a diversity of experience um, as well as a, 
uh, a proven record of having people who support them in, in their tasks uh, before they get promoted. Now, sometimes in the West, that's portrayed negatively. They say, oh, there's too much patronage in the system. But actually, if a public official at medium to high levels of government has many supporters and friends who could help him or her to implement uh, his or her ideas, then that's actually a good thing, not a bad thing. Well, compared to the Western style, I believe there are also effectiveness in selecting talents. <laughs> Otherwise, the Western society would have collapsed by now if they're not able to do that. But what's the major difference in the way how the selection or how the competition is held? It seems to some people that in the West, if you're very good at talking, <laughs> if, you, if you're good at communicating your idea to the masses, if you're able to campaign very well, you have a higher chance of being exposed in front of uh, you know, the constituencies and getting your votes, whereas in China, it's really not about how you speak in public. It's about basically how you work in, you know, in, in obscurity. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think that's a good way of, of putting it. Um, certainly in countries like um, the United States, it's, you have to give the same uh, speech to basically over and over again to different kinds of people. And again, from an ideal point of view, it seems like, uh, frankly, a bit of a waste of time. You would hope that public officials spend most of their time thinking about uh, what's the best way of implementing policy rather than uh, uh, giving the same speech over and over again, as well as, well, in, in cases like the United States, spending a lot of time raising money. The, the, I guess the problem with the Chinese system is that those of, those of us who know uh, officials, mm -hmm. and uh, we, we, I mean, I work in some sense within the political or within, the, well, I wouldn't say the political system, at least within the university system. And those who get promoted often tend to have a lot of ability and they spend their time working so hard. Um, and, but it's not well known or appreciated because it's hard to demonstrate that publicly. You talk about it's ridiculous to lump China together with other so-called non-Western democracies, such as the DPRK, such as Saudi Arabia, such as Egypt, and you say it is ridiculous to do that. Why did you say that? Well, again, it's a kind of um, a dogmatic view, I think, frankly, in, in, in the West. And again, it's only post-World War II um, that there's two kinds of legitimate of political systems. One is where leaders are selected by means of elections and the others are all the other ones and they're bad and the label is authoritarian and we don't distinguish too neatly between them. But that is ridiculous as we know. I mean, there's huge difference between family run dictatorships, you know, like in um, North Korea um, or military dictatorships like in Myanmar um, or the kinds of political systems you have in, in China. And what's the key difference? Well, the key difference is that China has made an effort to uh, reestablish a, a form of political meritocracy over the past four decades. It's an ongoing process. There's still a large gap between the re reality and the ideal, uh, but clearly um, to lump up those countries together as though they belong to the same kind of family or the same political animal is just, not just losing a lot of nuance, but it really fails to understand what's, what's distinctive about the Chinese political system. You're watching The Point with me, Liu Xin. We'll take a short break and we'll be back right after this. Stay with us. Well, it's very interesting because the Communist Party of China, well, is also a subject of uh, simplification in the West. On the other hand, the Communist Party of China has been able to take up this uh, uh, millennia-old tradition of meritocracy and use it in a way that serves the interest of the country very well. And of course, the interest of the party, uh, which, which says, you know, represents the overall interest of the people. How is that possible? What has married the Marxism, Leninism, and, you know, the Mao Zedong thought and Deng Xiaoping theory and uh, um, the, the idea of uh, Jiang, of Hu, and now of Xi Jinping with this meritocracy so well that it, yeah. it continues to work? Okay, I mean, I think that that's a, a good way of putting it, but, but we, I, I, the word meritocracy in English, I think some of it's a translation problem. It sends the wrong images because in, in English, the word meritocracy is actually fairly new. It was coined in 1957 uh, by a British sociologist, and it refers to um, not just the way that political leaders are selected, but the way that economic resources should be distributed, should be given to those with more merit, those who work harder and who have more talent. 
But I think in, China, in, in Chinese, we, we clearly, when we use the word xiannang, Zhengzhi, again, it sounds better in Chinese, it really refers to political meritocracy. We're talking about selecting political leaders, public officials who have above average ability and virtue, not about how to distribute economic resources. So I, I think um, we, we, re we really need to, to, to use the word political meritocracy to distinguish. Okay. So I think there was a strong recognition that we needed to revive a kind of form of political meritocracy where public officials have education, have experience, have proven record of talent, and then they should be promoted. And that worked because of, there was a, this long history of political meritocracy. It was easier for the reformists led by Deng Xiaoping to revive this because there was this history of uh, the ideal of political meritocracy meritocracy supported by a complex bureaucratic system, which goes back more than 2000 years. If there wasn't that history, it would have been infinitely harder. It's also a question about the size of the country. I mean, in China, there's a very, it's a huge country, as you know, and the, that the idea that there should be only one mechanism to select political leaders, that regardless of the level of government, I mean, that just seems crazy, right? What works in a local community of 100 people might not work in a big country of a billion people. And there's a recognition that, especially at medium to higher levels of government, there's a need for much more politically meritocratic mechanisms to select officials, whereas at lower levels of government, we need to have more participation and, and more democratic mechanisms um, so that people can input uh, have some sort of input in the political system. So it's the size of government was an issue. Yeah, yeah. Do, are, are you meaning to say, or did you mean to say that the, the way how the CPC is able to single out the problem and find ways, either traditional wisdom or, you know, the wisdom they found in Western ideas such as Marxism, and find practical ways to address this problem in a pragmatic manner? Um, sure. So it wasn't a blind um, adaptation of traditional mechanisms. Um, and, and some of the uh, practices that, well, I mean, obviously the revolutionary tradition was important, uh, for example, in equalizing relations between men and women, which uh, probably it wouldn't have happened had it not been for the, for the revolution. Um, but I think it was really a marriage. I mean, on some issues, like the idea that the main obligation of government is to uh, reduce poverty and to provide material well-being for the people. I mean, that idea goes way back in the Confucian tradition, too. Um, and arguably, one of the reasons why the socialist tradition became uh, popular in China is because it, it could latch on to this deeper ideal. So where there was a convergence between the mainstream political culture with these kind of new imports, such as Marxism, I think that's where there was more lasting uh, influence. It's also interesting you mentioned the poverty alleviation. We know that China really did a great deal and they managed to lift uh, all of the population out of uh, absolute uh, poverty. Is there a connection or a contribution that this political meritocracy has been able to do to contribute to the fact that China was able to eradicate ab absolute poverty? Um, well, sure. So. Uh, in the reform period, um, there was, I think there was more of a consensus, I mean, it, it goes way back to the late 70s and early 80s, that the main task of um, the government is to er eradicate poverty, and that the main mechanism to do that is to have economic development. Um, so public officials were rewarded on their ability to deliver economic growth, um, because that was viewed as the best way of eradicating poverty. And more recently, there were explicit targets um, which, which were tied to this effort to eliminate poverty, which also, and public officials were also promoted or demoted based on their ability to meet right. those targets. So clearly there, there was some sort of link, it, although it has to be demonstrated empirically in, in more detail. Right. Um, Anti-corruption is another uh, very important task and quoting your own words is a stake in the heart of the Chinese political system within the leadership. You once predicted in an interview in 2015 that in 10 years time, China's actions to tackle corruption will be better than those in the United States. Do you think you have been right? Oh, well, I, 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 don't, I don't remember saying that, but I can <laughs> say for sure We that. found it on the internet, obviously. <laughs> um, what, I, I guess what, I mean, in, in the US, it's a different kind of corruption. It's more, we can call it almost legalized corruption. Um, but so it's hard to compare. But anyway, in, in China, um, clearly, 
corruption has been made a priority. Um, and that was, again, uh, around, well, more than 10 years ago. The, the leaders themselves recognized that um, it posed a threat, an, well, an existential threat to the political system right. um, because the way that leaders derive legitimacy is by having superior ability and virtue. And what's the opposite of virtue? It's being corrupt. It's misusing public resources for your own private or family interest. And also you, there were surveys which, were, which show that the main worry of, among the Chinese people is corruption. So the, and, so, and that's why there was such strong opposition as well to officials, especially at the local level, because they were viewed as being very corrupt. So it was necessary to prioritize the fight against corruption in order to, uh, well, to basically save the political system. And I do think that overall, there's, it's been quite successful in reducing um, uh, the corruption, at least, for example, now it's, in the, it's, you know, in the past, whether to get into good schools or good hospitals, you had to often pay bribes and so on. Much of that has been e eliminated, those bad forms of uh, corruption. But there have been um, side effects which need to be uh, corrected. I think that there's too much now worry of being entrapped in the anti-corruption drive. So public officials sometimes become more conservative and, and less risk-taking than they used to be. And part of the reason why China grew so well is that public officials were encouraged to experiment and to innovate and take risks, and there's much less of that now. Yeah, it's a, it's a fine balance to tread, isn't it? Um, I want to ask you about the possible improvements that uh, the Chinese political meritocracy can, can, can work on. For instance, you were talking about the uh, lower level of political participation on the grassroots. So um, where do you think efforts can be made in order to make the system better? Because this is highly imperfect, as you said, just as the Western liberal system is highly imperfect. Well, um, as, as society modernizes, there's more of a, the, the, the issues become more complex. I mean, as mentioned in the early days of reform, we didn't have to argue too much because we knew what we need to focus on is reducing poverty. But now the issues are much more complex. Is it about poverty reduction? Is it about reducing gap between rich and poor? Is it about uh, providing conditions for more innovation and creativity? Uh, in science and in the arts? Um, is it about uh, environmental sustainability? And, and the answers are not obvious. So I think there's a need for much more input at lower levels to, to deliberate up, upon those priorities in an informed way. So there's a, a need for much more democratic mechanisms that provide more input by the people. But that needn't just yeah. take the form of elections. I mean, it could be um, democratic uh, deliberation, uh, you know, in Chinese, you say xie shang minzhu, uh, or it could be mechanisms like, right, or, or like sortition, chou qian in Chinese. There, um, there's many other ways to have more input by the people, yeah. so long as we allow for the view that there's no one system that'll work at all levels of government at all times. This is very interesting. Then people would say, why not? the Western style, one person, one vote, even universal suffrage, where you have a direct election of the leaders. Why does China not think this would fit its political realities? Well, the task, I think, is to hold on to the advantages of political meritocracy while having more democratic participation. And what are the advantages of political meritocracy is that all the leaders are guaranteed, as you said yourself, to have extensive experience and diverse experience at lower levels of government. If we had democratic elections at the top, somebody with no experience can be elected. Another advantage, all the leaders can take a long-term outlook. I mean, I see this as Dean. You know, we plan for like 2035, even 2050, mm -hmm. because we assume that more or less the same political system will be in place. But if yeah. we thought everything might change in four years, then we wouldn't be able to engage in this 20, 30 year planning, which matters on issues like climate change, right? I mean, frankly, I think Absolutely. we're more likely to expect China to stick to its goals than other countries where it might be a new form of government in, in four or five years. You talked about uh, the West being more close-minded now. You cited the example of Jean-Jacques Rousseau and uh, John Stuart Mill. Um, who, for instance, opposed the idea of one, per one person, one vote, instead uh, proposing the idea of plural voting. Um, what has happened, you think, to the West that uh, it has become so? Um, 
Well, I mean, I, th I think, as, as you mentioned, I mean, we need, so the great political theorists in the past, you know, whether it's Ersel or, or Montesquieu or Jean-Jacques Rousseau, I mean, they had a, an idea that the appropriate political system depends on the size of a country. For small countries to have more democracy is a wonderful idea. But when Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the most famous defender of democracy, was asked to advise the government of Poland, a large country, then he defended something that's much closer to what we would call political meritocracy. In 19th mm -hmm. century, John Stuart Mill, a liberal MP, you know, who he said educated people should have extra votes because they're more likely to make informed political judgments. Now nobody could get away with making those claims, at least in public. Things changed yeah. after World War II. I think one reason is because the US became so dominant. And when people thought of the opposite uh, of the US, there wasn't room for nuance. It was either totalitarian Stalinism or fascist Nazism. And, and, and if you defended an alternative, you, you'd be lumped up in one of those. And there was, and there's very, there was very little room for, for nuance. I think that, that kind of dogma has, has remained in the West and it's uh, yeah, unfortunately. My last question, coming back to the demonization of China, um, how is it going to be? Is it going to get any better anytime soon? And uh, what can be done? I mean, sometimes it makes me feel a bit helpless. Um, well, I, I think your, your show is great. Um, I hope it gets more, um, uh, well, I hope it gets more distribution. Uh, but Thank sometimes you. we need to just forget about the West, right? I mean, even at my university, we train many uh, pub public officials from countries like Laos and, and Rwanda and, and, and so on. They're much more, sim and, and Bangladesh, and they're much more open to learning about the Chinese political system. They don't come in with these uh, dogmas that are hard to shake. Um, of course, at the end of the day, China has to set a good model at home. And, and if it relies more on uh, humane um, mechanisms, you know, let's say Confucian style, uh, rather than kind of um, repression, I think it would also set a better model and others would be more willing to learn. Thank you so much, Daniel Bell, Dean of the School of Political Science and Public Administration of Shandong University. It's truly been a very inspiring experience. Thank you for having me. It's an honor. I've been talking to Professor Daniel Bell from Shandong University. And that's it for this edition of The Point with me, Liu Xin. As always, you can follow me on Facebook and Twitter using the handle Liu Xin in Beijing. Thanks for watching. You've got The Point.